lecture, I told him earlier that, you know, uh, when you go to lectureships that have breakout sessions, uh, you never know how many is going to be in your session. I, I usually have the person introducing me, my wife, and my two oldest boys, unless there's a better speaker that they, like for the apologetics press guys at PTP, they always want to go hear them. So uh, anything above that is gravy, but I'm glad that you're in here and thankful that you're here, a part of this lectureship. Um, we do have, even though we don't play each other, Tennessee and, and Boise State, we have the orange in common, so that's good. Uh, we live in Denver, and we're Denver Broncos fans, so there's that commonality, both in blue and orange and the Broncos. So, uh, but even more than that, we share Jesus in common, and we're thankful for that, and uh, thankful for this good lectureship, and we're grateful to be a part of it. Let me tell you a little bit about a young lady that grew up uh, in the area uh, where I did in northwest Tennessee. In fact, she grew up on the same road that I grew up on. Her name's Cherry. And uh, Cherry was, when she was 15, decided that she was going to one day teach herself to drive. Her parents were gone, and so she got in the family car. She put it in reverse. She gave it way too much gas and charged out of the, the uh, carport and rear-ended a tree. In her panic... She put it back in drive, gave it way too much gas, started down the driveway and sideswiped a tree, which tore the door off of the car and ejected her from the car. Uh, she had several broken bones. Her leg was severely cut in multiple places. Uh, she was uh, airlifted down to Le Bonheur Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, where they set the bones. They did several surgeries to... Uh, take care of the cuts that she had. They put her in a cast. Uh, very quickly, gangrene set up in that leg, and it began to spread. And uh, the only choice the doctors had was to amputate her left leg just below the knee. You can imagine, if you can remember, some of you are still in that point, but if you can think back to the days when you were a teenager, how awkward that was, uh, how, how those years were were those that, you know, you really struggled with your identity, with self-confidence, those types of things. So you can try to imagine for a 15-year-old girl when she wakes up after surgery to see that her left leg is gone from the knee down and how devastating that was. For a young man, it would be, I, I would imagine for a young lady, it would be even more devastating. And she talked about how that, that she didn't think that any man would ever find her attractive, that she would never be able to get married, that uh, she would always be considered someone who was a freak. And everyone that tried to console her and help her, including her parents, she wanted absolutely nothing to do with because in her mind, you have no idea what I'm going through. Now, all of those that tried to help her loved her very dearly. And all of them probably, because of different sufferings they had gone through in their life, had a better idea of what she was dealing with than she really thought. But she didn't think that they knew what she was struggling with. The topic that I've been given for this hour is to witness Jesus' healings. And there are a number of reasons why that it was necessary for God to put on flesh and come to this earth and go through the things that we are going through. But one of them is so that He can have an understanding of what we go through in this life. Now, let me clarify what I'm telling you when I say that. Jesus, as God, knows everything. And so He didn't have to come learn something from us or from living here on this earth. But by His coming here and living on this earth, it gives us a better appreciation for what He understands, doesn't it? Now, we, we can, as, as Gary mentioned last night, we can't ever suggest you don't know what it feels like to be tempted. We also can't say you don't know what it feels like to suffer as a human being here on this earth. Because He does. He know that, knew that because He was God, but He knows it even more so because... He's experienced it as a man. So if you'll turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew, that's where we're going to camp out. I'll be honest with you, uh, when it was first sent to me, my, my topics and the text, I looked at, and I don't remember which verse it was, but I looked at the verse that originally was on my list, and um, 
it, I, I read it a few times. I finally called Richard and I said, maybe I'm missing something or not understanding something or maybe this is a misprint, but I don't think this verse has anything to do with a healing. And he laughed and he said, no, it sure doesn't. He said, so you pick. What do you want to... I said, what about Matthew 9? And he said, that'd be great. Before we get into Matthew 9, though, let me explain about what's going on with Matthew 9. The, the goal of Matthew is to convince the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. Of course, all four of the Gospels were written telling the story of Jesus' life here on this earth. Each of them, though, were written to a different group and each of them from a different perspective. Sometimes people will try to lump Matthew, Mark, and Luke together. You may have heard them called the Synoptic Gospels from time to time. And sometimes people will suggest that there are problems with the text because Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't line up exactly. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke never claim to line up exactly. Uh, they're doing different things. For example, some of the things we're going to study about in Matthew chapter 9, one of the, some of the critics will point out that they don't happen in the same chronological order in which they do in the Mark and Luke. Matthew never claimed that he was writing a chronological uh, account of Jesus' life, though there are some times where he gives us some time stamps. But for the most part, Matthew is taking a very systematic approach and sometimes even a topical approach to prove to the Jews, when you look back at all of the things that you see in prophecy, that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah that you've been looking for. Now, let me show you the way that he does that. He basically uses three different avenues to do this. He will allow us to see Jesus' miracles that he performs. And after Jesus performs those miracles, there are a number of people that will begin to follow him. That allows Jesus to have the opportunity to do what he really wants to do, and that's to teach people. That teaching causes more people to follow him. He'll do more miracles so that they will gain more followers, and then he will teach them. And that, that cycle continues really throughout the entire book of Matthew. For example, in chapter 4, verses 23 through 24, you have one of nine different times of what I call a generic healing verse where it just says Jesus healed a bunch of different people in a lot of different ways. And then immediately after that, in chapter 4 and verse 25, it says because of those healings, he had large amounts of people following him. The very next thing that we go into is Matthew chapters 5 through 7, which we all know is the Sermon on the Mount, this long teaching section where Jesus is teaching about righteousness throughout that entire sermon. At the end of which... It says that the people were amazed because he spoke as one who had authority. Not like the, the scribes and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were, were big on quoting uh, Rabbi so-and-so said this and Rabbi so-and-so said that. Jesus didn't teach that way. Jesus taught as one who had authority himself. And so then we go right into, as the cycle continues after his teaching, we get to Matthew chapter 8 and 9 which are two miracle chapters. So now that Jesus is taught, we're going to see, Matthew's going to show us again, all of these miracles that Jesus was able to perform, just as the Old Testament prophecies said that he would be able to. So in Matthew chapter 8, you have five different miracles, all that have to do showing that Jesus had power over anything and everything on this planet. Then you go into Matthew chapter 19 and he, he narrows that down and said, let's just talk about Jesus' healing. And Jesus has five different healings in Matthew chapter 9 that, as we're going to show, shows his power and shows his ability to heal no matter what. So what I want us to do for the next few minutes is to go through Matthew chapter 9 and look at these five different healings from Matthew chapter 9 and as we do, we're going to learn about Jesus. We're going to see what, what these healings witness to us about Jesus. And then at the end, we're going to, think, I think, see something that's very important for us to get as we recognize who Jesus is and what that should mean to us as well. First of all, as you look in Matthew chapter 8 and 9, you'll notice that there's, there's two of those generic healings. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 16, He healed all who were ill. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35, he was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now, if you're like me, when you read that, you think, every kind? 
Because whenever my boys come downstairs and I say, did you clean your room? They say, we cleaned everything up. Guess what my next question is? Everything? Can we go play outside? Did you do your chores? We did all our chores. My next question is, all your chores? <laughs> so when, when uh, Matthew makes this statement that Jesus healed every kind of sickness, every kind of disease, if we're going to be good investigators, that ought to be our question is, every kind of disease, every kind of illness, and in Matthew chapter 9, we see that's the case. First of all, we have the account of the paralytic. Now, I'll let you know, for those of you that have never heard me preach before, uh, I, I'm not a lawyer. I, I'm a country boy, and I, I teach and preach. You don't have to worry about me preaching over your head because I'm not smart enough to. Um, I usually preach on a level that a C student from Poduck, Tennessee, can understand what we're talking about. But one of the things I like to do, and I hope you have your Bibles open, and I hope you have a pen, I hope you like to write in your Bible, uh, because what I like to do when I preach is go through the text and show you how I have my Bible back at my desk in my office marked up, and you can mark yours if you'd like in the same way, so that we learn not only the text, but maybe uh, how to uh, take some notes in your text, and you can go back. The last thing I want you to do when I get through preaching is say, man, he's a great preacher. I want you to leave this room and say, Matthew 9 is an awesome text. And when you go back with these notes, you can, you can uh, go through and see that very thing. So Matthew chapter 9, we have the paralytic. It's also in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Mark chapter 2, 1 through 12 gives us a little bit more information uh, about what goes on than Matthew does. But Matthew begins by saying, Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city, that's Capernaum, where he had made his base camp for his, his days of ministry. They brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, if he's paralyzed, the first thing that, that we have to think about is, you know, what, what caused that? It's an internal thing. But it could be a variety of things. It could be a variety of muscular problems or skeletal problems that's going on. What exactly it is, we don't know. It's one thing for a guy to walk up and say, I hurt my knee right here. Can you heal that? Jesus is having to diagnose with just what he knows and be able to see the problem and then be able to fix it. So these friends bring this paralytic to Jesus and obviously the problem is that he can't walk, he can't move, he's lying on his bed. So Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And the friends are probably thinking, now wait a minute, that's not exactly why we brought him here, right? That's like you going to the doctor because you've got uh, a broken leg and he says, well, I paid your house payment for you this month. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, but that's not exactly why I'm here right now, doc. You know, this isn't the problem they think. But to Jesus, that is the problem, see. But as he says, your sins are forgiven. Well, of course, all of those scribes that are following him around looking for ways to deter uh, people from following Jesus, they immediately have a problem with that. And the problem that they have with that is they say this man is blaspheming because the only individual that can forgive sins is God. God. And if Jesus is saying that he forgives sins, then what's Jesus saying he is? God. God. And that's blasphemy. Because Jesus is just a man. Jesus is a carpenter's son from the wrong side of the tracks, in fact. I mean, if there's going to be a guy that's the Messiah, if there's going to be a guy that is God the Son, it's not going to be this guy, Right? So they think that he's blaspheming. Well, Jesus has not only the x-ray vision to be able to see what's wrong internally with this guy, his x-ray vision is so good that he can see even what they're thinking. So notice what happens in the next few verses, because God can only do that, and that would mean that he's stoning. Jesus says, why are you thinking evil in your hearts? They're thinking he's blaspheming, so that means they're thinking he needs to be stoned. They're thinking that Jesus has done... Sometimes we, we give the scribes and Pharisees a hard time, and, and sometimes rightfully so, but sometimes you've got to think about it from their perspective. I mean, this is, just a, this is just one of these Jewish kids that we've seen grow up, and now he's saying he's God? 
They're thinking evil of Jesus, not because necessarily of the evil in their hearts, but they're thinking Jesus has done something evil. Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Because you've blasphemed. You can't say that you're forgiving sin, but that's exactly what he's done. So Jesus asked them a question. He says, which is easier? And he gives them two options, to say that your sins are forgiven or to say to this man, get up and walk. Now, what's the answer? Which is easier? We might say, well, it's easier to say you get up and walk because none of us can take care of the sin problem. But by easier, what Jesus means is what's more easily or harder to prove, rather. You know, if I say get up and walk and he doesn't get up and walk, then you can say you're a phony. But I can say your sins are forgiven all down. In fact, there are people in the religious world right now that will say your sins are forgiven that don't have the authority to do that. But we can't prove necessarily from what we see that they're wrong or right. Are you with me? So Jesus says, which is easier? Which is the harder to prove? And of course, what is harder to prove is that you've actually forgiven sins. And so what Jesus says, so that you know that the Son of Man has authority. That's a key word in this particular miracle. Because you know that the Son of Man has authority, He said, I'm going to do what is the easier to prove. Okay? I'm going to say, get up and walk. And if that happens, then you know I have the authority to do the other, right? So that's what he says. He says to the paralytic in verse 6, get up and pick up your bed and go home. Jesus picked number 2. That's what he picked. And guess what happened? The man got up and went home. That was the harder thing to prove. And he did it. So guess what that means? Now, if you think about it from the Jews' theology on miracles, their idea is that God's not going to allow someone to do a miracle that God doesn't approve of. So if Jesus can do a miracle, what does that mean? That means God approves of him, right? And if he can do number two, make a man get up and walk, then that would mean he could do number one, forgive a man for his sins. And if he can forgive a man of his sins, what does that make him? Well, the scribes don't want to go down that road, right? But that's what Jesus has done. And so when the crowd saw this, it says that they were awestruck. The the word here for awestruck actually is the the word for fear. Uh, Sometimes we'll say that that in the Bible, when we're talking about fearing God, it means have a healthy, healthy respect for. The Greek word actually looks like our English word phobia. So all of you that have arachnophobia, do you have a healthy respect for spiders? Or do you fear spiders? I, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a healthy respect for snakes. I am scared to death of snakes. One of the main reasons I keep a hole and a shotgun around my house at all times is to take care of snakes. They feared because they're in the presence of God. And because of that, they glorified God and they praised God because He had given this authority to Him. So when we witness Jesus' healings, what we're witnessing is Jesus' authority. Then you keep on looking in Matthew chapter 9, and if you jump down to verse 20 through 22... Then you have the account of this particular woman who has a a bad problem. Now, again, the other accounts give us a little bit more detail than Matthew does, but, but the important part that Matthew's wanting us to see, we get to see. There's this woman that comes along who's had a hemorrhaging issue, some kind of internal bleeding issue that's going on. There are some that thinks that maybe this is a, a feminine issue with her cycle. We're not sure exactly what it is, but some kind of bleeding, which would mean that she is unclean and anyone that's near her is unclean. So the vast majority of people, I mean, you think about the courage that it would take. Mark talks about more detail about this. The courage it would take for her to go through the crowds. Because every time she bumps into someone, you're unclean, see? And there's a purification process that has to go through. No one would have wanted anything to do with her. And so she says, if I can just go and and touch the hem of his garment, 
The, the, the tassels is what the word is, which kind of shows that, that Jesus was uh, wearing rabbinic robes. He was a teacher. If I can just touch his garment, then I will get well. Well, where did she get that idea? I mean, there's nowhere in Scripture where it says if you touch the Messiah's garment, you're going to get better of what's, what ails you. Where in the world would she come up with such a ludicrous idea? Right? I mean, imagine if you have some sort of internal bleeding and you're saying, call the ambulance. And I'm like, no, run back there and touch Richard's suit coat. We, we sometimes think that the ties are holy. So maybe if you touch his tie, you know, that'll, that'll be really what gets it. What would give her such an idea? But I want you to notice this person that has this ludicrous idea, this unclean woman that no one else would have wanted to have dealt with, how Jesus deals with her. He says, notice he says, that's authority. It's all he had to do was say it. He says, daughter. That's a term of affection. See, Daughter, take courage. I don't want you to be afraid. I don't want you to think that you have to sneak up on me. I don't want you to think that you have to ease through the crowd. I want you to have courage when you come to me because I care for you. And he shows that by what he calls her. And he says, your faith has made you well. And at once, just like that, the woman was well. That's a miracle, see. It's not slowly over time. It's immediate. And that's what happens here because Jesus cared enough for her to stop and comfort her. See, when we witness Jesus' healings, we witness Jesus caring because He cares. We sing the song, does Jesus care? Oh, yes, He cares. I know He cares. One of the reasons we know He cares is because when we witness Jesus' healing, we witness His caring. Number three, we see the story of the daughter. And this actually begins back up a few verses in verses 18 and 19. But Jesus is going to be interrupted in that one with the woman. And that's why we covered it before we actually covered this one. But if you jump back up to verses 18 and 19, while Jesus was still talking with them, remember the first one, the paralytic, when he's talking to them about this whole scenario of which is easier to say and which is easier, harder to prove, that kind of thing. When all of that conversation is going on, while he was saying to them, this to them, a synagogue official who would have been a very powerful and a very important person. This is a guy that is used to having people bow down and honor him because of his position and his authority. He came and bowed down to Jesus. And the word there in the Greek is actually the word for worshipped. He bowed down and worshipped Jesus. See? This is a man who knows authority, who knows power, and he recognizes Jesus has it, see. And he comes to Jesus and he says, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Again, we have to ask the question, where in the world would you come up with that idea? Where in the world would you get the idea that if you just lay your hand on her, that's going to be enough to, to raise her from... I mean, it's one thing to, to heal someone who's sick. It's one thing to heal someone who has a, a medical or physical problem. But we're taking it to a whole different level now, aren't we? I mean, you're talking about system shutdown. You're talking about they're dead. Now, because we've got the full account of Jesus' life from all the four gospel writers. And we've seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead by just saying, Lazarus, come forth. We understand he didn't have to do that, right? But where did this guy get that idea? See? So Jesus got up and began to follow him, said to his disciples, and on the way he's interrupted with that woman. And that's the account we just looked at. After that's over with, when Jesus came into this official's house and saw the flute players and the crowd and noisy disorder, this is professional mourners that they would have. And, and they would actually hire, you know, my papa used to say, something happens to me, no one's going to show up for my funeral. Well, they were so afraid of that, they would hire professional mourners and follow them around. And, they, and, and if you go over to Bible lands uh, into the, the, the Near East, the Middle East, that this, you'll still see this very same thing. 
People just wailing and crying and, and, and throwing dirt up in the air on themselves and, and all sorts of things. And, and you'll walk up and say, you must have been closer. Oh, I didn't know who it was, actually. You know, they're, they're being hired to show. And the more mourners that you hire, the more authority and power you have. So it's, it's a big deal to show. So he has these professional mourners. And Jesus tells them, y'all can leave because the girl's just asleep. Well, guess what their reaction is? They begin laughing at him. Listen, it's not like I've never seen a dead person before. <clears throat> it's not like that, that I haven't ever seen. Some, you know, you mentioned last night the, uh, the account of the paramedic that was there with, with Elvis. How many, how many people that were deceased had that paramedic walked up on? I mean, it wasn't like he could say, I saw Elvis and he was dead. Maybe you were mistaken that he was, oh no, <laughs> I've seen dead people. That, that's not like the, the movie where I see dead people. I mean, I've literally seen dead bodies, right? I know what it means. These are professional mourners. When we say she's dead, trust us, she's dead. But Jesus says, no, she's just asleep. You don't have anything to worry about. So when the crowd had been sent out, he entered and took her by the hand. That's all it took. It actually didn't take that much, but that's what the man asked for, so that's what Jesus did. Took her by the hand, and notice what happened. Immediately, she got up. And then it says the news spread throughout all of the land. Can you imagine? This is a guy that would have been well-known. Everybody would have known this guy, someone with power and prestige. His daughter died. We know she died because we saw the professional mourners over at her house. And now, look who's walking up with him. How quickly would that spread? When someone that's well-known in your community dies, how quickly does that news spread? How big a deal would you think that it would be if you're getting ready to go to the visitation at the funeral home and somebody calls and says, Hey, Johnny's alive. Do what? <laughs> It'd be viral on Facebook. It'd be viral on Facebook. That, that would be one of those... Uh, those uh, break down the internet kind of news stories, right? It went everywhere because this guy's doing something like we've never seen before. When you witness Jesus' miracles, you witness Jesus' power. And it's amazing the power that he has. You keep looking at Matthew chapter 9, you get to verse 27, and you see the blind come to Jesus. These two blind men are going to come to him. He went from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. Now when they're saying son of David, they're not just saying we got on genealogy.com and we found out who your great, 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 great. They're saying we recognize you are the Messiah. You know, it's interesting to me that in the Gospels, everywhere you look, it's the blind people that can see the best. And the people that see the best are the blindest. That, that's maybe nowhere more apparent than when you look in John's account of Jesus dealing with the blind man there. These two men are seeing what everybody else is. I wonder who he is. Well, you knuckleheads, we're blind and we can see it. He's the son of David. He's the Messiah. You know, when you get to John 7 and 8 and that, that big uh, argument that's taking place at the temple about, about who this man is, and some saying he he's, uh, works for the devil, and some saying he's a good man, and some saying that, and finally somebody says, well, when the Messiah comes, is he going to be able to do more than this guy's done? No way. And the blind can see that. So they're coming to him and say, have mercy on us. We need help. And so notice what happens. He, Jesus says, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said, well, of course. Yes, we do. How did they know that? Now, maybe it was because they were there falling away from the, the daughter being right. Maybe it's because, but they're hearing what's going on. They're recognizing this guy's doing stuff like never before. And... We hadn't seen him do this, but if he can do that, surely he can do this, right? We've got problems with our eyes of some sort, and they say, we know that you can do that. So he touched their eyes, and he said, here's authority, it shall be done according 
to your faith. Well, what was their faith? They came to Him believing, you're the Messiah. They came to Jesus because we know you're the one to come to. They came to Jesus because we're looking at your healings and we're saying that you're not just an ordinary guy. You're not just a good teacher. You're not just a good man. We're going to deal with that in the morning at 9 o'clock. You're something special. You are the Messiah. That's, remember, what Matthew's trying to get the Jews to recognize through what he's writing here. So their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, see that no one knows about this. You know, Mark especially, you see that messianic secret where, where Jesus is telling them don't tell and there's lots of debate about why. Maybe Jesus is waiting on the right time. Obviously, if you've seen two guys that have been blind all their life and they're walking around without their canes, aren't you going to know? So I think probably what he's telling them is, is that up there in verse 27. Don't tell them that I'm the son of David. I don't want them getting the idea that I'm here to be a literal king sitting on the throne. Because that's what they finally figured, thought about Jesus, wasn't it? You remember after he feeds the, the, the multitudes in John chapter 6, they came, this big crowd comes to him. What were they wanting to do? They're wanting to take him and bring him to sit on David's throne. You're the guy that's going to lead us to promise. You're going to kick the Romans out. We're going to be the dominant nation again, just like the good old days when David and Solomon was reigning in the kingdom. Jesus said, I won't, don't want you to do that because that's not what I'm really here for. The point of these healings was never about making sure he could sit on David's throne in Jerusalem. The point of his miracles was never about taking care of all of those who were sick and afflicted. It wasn't ending death and suffering. It was about, I have a mission. And that mission is to be the ruler over God's kingdom that's going to last for eternity. And when we witness Jesus' healings, we witness Jesus' mission. Because that's what he was always focused on. And then finally in Matthew chapter 9, we see this mute man that uh, is there in verses 32 through 34. They were, as they were coming out, there was this man who was mute. And there are a lot of reasons why someone might not have the ability to speak, but uh, we're told exactly, usually it's some kind of brain disorder, that it's not, sometimes it's the case that, that the hardware is not there, if I can say it that way, to make you produce sounds. Most of the time it's something is wrong in the brain that causes someone not to be able to speak. And he tells us exactly what it is that's wrong with this man. He was demon-possessed. That's what had caused this particular illness that he had of not being able to speak. So they brought this, uh, this demon-possessed man. And notice how many times it talks about this. Verse 33, there's demon. Verse 34, there's demon. Then in verse 34, there's demon. It's clear what's caused this sickness is these demons. But even with that, notice Jesus' power. After the demon was cast out. I mean, you think about if you've ever watched any kind of uh, horror movies. Uh, it was funny yesterday, uh, uh, Garrett and Gordon and the boys, are, they're in, in one room looking at uh, the TV. We've got our Apple TV hooked up. They're on VidAngel looking for, they wanted to watch a scary movie. Well, every time on, vid, on our, our Apple TV, you can search something, it pops up on my phone for me to type in. And I know they're searching for a scary movie. So every time it pops up on my phone, I type, I'm watching you. <laughs> and I can hear them in the other room going, what's that? And they erase it and they try to do it again. It pops up on my phone and I type, I'm watching you. And Garrett's like, is somebody watching us? What's going on? You know, it's freaking that. Well, you. It's horror movies, they, they make this big spectacle. If someone is demon-possessed, you know, they have to have all the right equipment and the right person, and, and they have to go through this big ceremony. Even in, in those who believe and practice such things, in the religious world today, I mean, it's, it's a, an extravagant event to cast out a, a demon or a devil or an evil spirit out of someone. Matthew records it like he picked a crumb out of his teeth with a toothpick. After the demon was cast out, that's no big deal for Jesus. After the demon was cast out, the mute man 
spoke. And notice what happened. After the mute man spoke, the crowds were amazed. This is not the fear word. This is the bewilderment, shocked, that was awesome kind of word. They were amazed and said, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. Now what's Matthew trying to drive home here to these Jews that are reading this? You've been looking for centuries for this one that's going to come that was like no other. Jesus is that one. And yet the Pharisees were saying he casts out demons by the powers of demons. In Mark, Jesus goes on to say that didn't even make any sense. Why would you even suggest something like that? Right? It wasn't Abraham Lincoln that said it first. It was Jesus that said it first. That a house divided against itself will not stand. But you see how far they're going to try to nullify what Jesus has done. Their heart is, we want power and authority. Jesus' heart is, I want to minister to people that I care for. I want to save your soul. And I don't care what the detractors say, I'm focused on what my Father sent for me to do. So when we witness Jesus' healings, we witness Jesus' heart. He cares about us, not about His authority. He cares about us. Witness Jesus' healings. That's so important, to witness Jesus' healings. Not, not so much just because of what goes on in the healing of a physical ailment itself, but to watch what goes on when Jesus actually does. Now, it's interesting. Denny Petrillo one time was, was teaching this section of Matthew at a lectureship in Oklahoma. I was telling him I was going to cover Matthew 9, and he said, did I ever tell you about the doctor that approached me after I teach this section? I said, no. He said, I had a doctor come up to me once, and he said, uh, in Oklahoma City at a lectureship, and he said, you know those five areas? are the five areas that as a doctor we would say are the five major areas that you deal with. You've got the scalar, uh, muscular uh, matter that's dealt with in the paralytic man. You've got uh, the organ problem with the blind man. You've got system shut down with uh, the, the dead man. You've got uh, 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 internal bleeding and, and intestinal problem with the woman. And then you've got a brain disorder with now, I've looked online, and I'll be honest with you, I, again, I did stay at the Holiday Inn Express last night, but I don't have a lot of medical training. I can't really find anything that breaks it down, but I'm taking this doctor's word that he knows more about it than I do. But even if it doesn't exactly line up with what the American Medical Association says, when, when Matthew says that Jesus healed all, every kind of sickness and every kind of illness, what's left out? What can he not take care of? And if he can take care of that, as he told them, can he take care of our worst problem that we have? The worst sickness that we struggle with? The worst kind of cancer that eats up our society today in sin? And you know why he does? Is because in every one of those stories, what you see is Jesus who was talked about last night as the one who created everything, who we're going to talk about in the morning as the one who created everything, cares enough about us that individually He knows what we're going through. And He cares for us. Amen. He says, you know, how much He knows about us and how much He cares about us is that He knows the number of hairs on our heads. And let's be honest, guys, for some of us, that's a number that changes day to day, right? And yet he still knows. Because Jesus cares. Cherry, the girl I told you about at the beginning, she actually had a, a man that came to visit her who was a, um, uh, a man that had... Uh, when he was a teenager, he was about 30 years her senior at that point. But when he was a younger man, he was actually involved in a farming accident in which he lost his right leg from the knee down. And we heard about Cherry. He drove down to Memphis. He walked into her room. He sat down on the edge of her bed. He took his leg off and swung his stump over on the bed and talked to her. He never mentioned hospitals. He never mentioned legs. He never mentioned surgery. 
He just talked about life. And when he left that day, she recognized that that, even with what had happened, I can have a normal life. And I'm thankful that she recognized that because she's my mama. And that's a picture of her with my daddy and me down there on the end, as cute as I am, and my brother, who was the ugly one of the bunch. But what made a difference for her was knowing that there was someone that had been through what she had been through that cared about her. I don't know what you may be dealing with in your life. Some sickness or some illness that you may have. Maybe it's some mental problem. that you, Maybe it's some sort of addiction. Maybe it's marital problems or relationship problems. Maybe it's just a sin struggle that you're dealing with. When we witness Jesus, we know that Jesus heals because Jesus cares. Amen. Oh, yes, He cares. I know He cares. And when we see Jesus in Matthew 9, we not only see God the Son who's powerful to take care of everything that's wrong with us, but we see God the Son who loves us enough to notice what's wrong with us and say, I'm the answer for any problem that you have in this life. Witness Jesus' healings, and we witness some of the most vital characteristics of who God the Son really is. And it helps us to not only appreciate His power and His authority, but also recognize how much He loves us and how all-encompassing His grace and His forgiveness can be in our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Corey, and uh, all of you that came participate in this uh, effort. We thank you so much for coming back out of the auditorium for uh, additional people and materials. We're going to take a break now and uh, we'll be back at uh, 1.30 in the auditorium for our afternoon session. And uh, I just want to have a quick prayer and then uh, we'll be dismissed for lunch.